competing apologies that we're late. I'm back extremely sorry. Uh, there have been various things happening in the same. And I have to say, since I was in, uh, in the British Parliament on Wednesday with a demonstration outside against the raising of the British retirement age, it's very nice to come to home from home and see demonstrations against the raising of the Polish retirement age. Um, I've been asked to speak on the future of Europe. And my first response was to say, anyone who thinks that they dare say what the future of Europe will be beyond the next six months, when we have a Eurozone crisis not yet entirely resolved, is perhaps a little optimistic. The British position, of course, on the Eurozone is that we understand how vital it is to the whole of Europe, including Britain, that the Eurozone survives and prospers, and that we return the European Union to growth. We are strongly supportive of all the efforts are made in that area, but of course are unavoidably like the Polish uh, government and people, um, something of a spectator uh, to those who are themselves inside the Eurozone. Um, we are pursuing alongside that a growth agenda because austerity is not enough. And the danger of what is happening in the Eurozone crisis is, of course, that austerity is imposed on too many members of the Eurozone and that the rest of us are plunged into recession as a result. There's an underlying crisis behind this, of course, which is the transition from the old model of the European project, which was a reconciliation between France and Germany, a core Europe to which Britain was not originally a member, and of course Poland was entirely unthought of in those post-Second World War uh, days. Um, and with that project, in a sense, has been dissolved in an enlarged European Union. Britain was always a strong supporter of enlargement from the time when we joined through the Spanish, Greek, and Portuguese accession through to the Eastern Europeans. Um, but we haven't yet entirely agreed on what sort of Europe we want, and we still face the Brussels institutions in some ways pursuing the old project as if a core Europe is still any longer an option. We also suffer, all of us, an absence of European leadership. If you think back to the late 1980s, when you had Helmut Kohl in Germany speaking about the future of Europe, you had François Mitterrand in France, you had Jacques Delors as President of the European Commission, and you had Margaret Thatcher, if you read her Bruges speech, her Bruges speech carefully, talking about the longer term prospects. A wonderful phrase that she used in the Bruges speech, you have to remember that Warsaw, Prague and Budapest are also European capitals for which we have to share some responsibility. Now, sadly, in every single country we have political leaders who talk about domestic priorities and domestic politics because that's what their publics, their electorates, want them to do. And that's a real problem which we face. My party leader said to a group of us um, some weeks ago, of course, being an internationalist liberal in a global recession is not easy. Um, global recession means right-wing populism, means blaming foreigners, minorities, immigrants. Uh, liberalism goes with 3% annual growth. And again, all of us, and I stress all of us, not just the British, are stuck with popular discontent. Of course, you're more aware of the Yoga skepticism of the British press because everyone reads English. Um, I expect that journalists in Poland don't look at the Italian press or the Kronen Zeitung in Vienna or others to recognize that the uh, tabloid press is pretty rabid and anti fauna in most of our European capitals. Um, it's just that the British press circulates rather more widely. So what is the British view? And I say on the Eurozone, we are unavoidably some of a spectator, but half of our 
trade is with the European Union. And that means that it's vitally in our interest, as well as in the interest of all of our European partners, that this is successfully resolved. This coalition government in Britain, like its predecessor, is committed to staying in. We know that we are better off in, as the British Foreign Secretary remarks, opposed therefore to the populist campaign of the right wing press, that we would be better off out. So we're committed to a deepening of the single market. The single market, after all, the legacy of Margaret Thatcher and of Arthur Cofield as a commissioner, along with Jacques Delors. And we want to see the single market fully implemented, we discovered in the Greek crisis just how imperfect the single market had been implemented in a number of, of countries, Greeks, well, a large number of things which they had not entirely enforced. We want to see the single market extended further in the service sector, particularly important to Britain as a major service provider. Although let me say to anyone who reads the French press that Britain has a larger manufacturing sector than France, contrary to what President Sarkozy says, and Britain last year had the largest increase in car exports we have had for a very long time. Uh, it happens that the cars being exported are made now by Japanese, German and Indian owned companies. Nevertheless, they are made by British workers and contribute to the British balance to payments. We want to see a digital single market and we want to see energy deregulation. And that for us is part of a strategy to get the European Union back towards growth. We want to see a budget which is biased much more heavily in favour of innovation and research and in assistance to the poorer areas of the community rather than a budget which continues to spend 40% on agriculture. We want to see investment on trans-European networks linking the EU together, including linking Eastern and Central Europe more closely with Western Europe. And we want to see an open Europe, that is to say, in pursuit of freer international trade. Our Deputy Prime Minister has just returned from Korea. Uh, we have negotiated an EU-Korea trade agreement. We are all conscious that on our own, none of us could have managed to negotiate as advantageous a free trade agreement. Uh, now, given that global deregulation of trade has been blocked within the World Trade Organization, multilateral trade agreements of this sort around the world, perhaps even with the United States, has to be the way forward. We see Europe as a global player in a world in which power and prosperity is shifting to Asia. We were a global player with our French partners and with the Belgians, the Danes, the Norwegians, the French and the Italians in Libya. We are doing everything that we can to support the Arab Spring, the beginnings of what we hope will be a process of transition to more open societies, more democratic regimes across the Middle East, although it's a very painful process we're all watching what's happening in Syria with increasing concern. We are committed to an active neighbourhood policy. I spent some time last night and this morning asking our Polish partners what we do about Belarus and which we need all the advice that the Poles can give us. Um, an eastern neighbourhood policy as well as a southern neighbourhood policy. And we are strongly in favour of European Defence Corporation. I know your Foreign Minister yesterday made a slightly slighting remark about the British and the European Defence Corporation, but I would say we have become sceptical about institution building in defence after our experience in promoting multilateral European Defence Corporation in the late 1990s and early 2000s, in which we had 15 different working groups agreeing on European capabilities among defence ministries, 
only to be vetoed by their finance ministries, which would not provide the money. Uh, so, we are working with the French, Britain and France together, spend 40% of the money spent on defence within the European Union. We are working with others, and we are deployed with others. I mentioned uh, what's happening in Libya. We have had an Estonian company embedded in a British battalion um, in Helmand, in Afghanistan, through several tours. We've had very close cooperation with the Danes, again in Helmand. We are next year going to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the first really integrated unit amongst European countries, the British Dutch Marine Amphibious Force. And there was extending naval cooperation, we provide some training for Belgian and Dutch and German navies, and that clearly has to be a way forward. We look towards a larger Europe with a secure neighbourhood to its east and its south. A larger Europe means continuing the process of enlargement, Croatia next year, the rest of the Western Balkans, we hope, within the next five to ten years, and further on from that, perhaps Ukraine, perhaps eventually Belarus, and we still hope perhaps also Turkey. So a great deal of work to be done, and I'm not entirely sure how far our Polish partners are on board, a European Union which comes to grips with the challenges of climate change. Um, setting targets for reduction in emissions, leading the way to the protests of the Americans and the Chinese, the closeness of the American-Chinese alliance in resisting uh, the charging of aircraft for uh, emissions which they uh, constitute in sight when they're in flight is itself uh, very uh, interesting. But climate change is a high priority of our government through European cooperation. Our view on European institutions is that the institutions we have are imperfect, but we have to do our best to work through them. And a strong institutional structure is extremely important to making sure that we not only negotiate agreements, but that we do implement and enforce agreements. We would of course like to see reforms, some of the same reforms as your foreign minister mentioned in his speech yesterday, fewer commissioners for example, more effective commission, but that isn't going to happen in the foreseeable future. The Lisbon, Lisbon Treaty left us with a great deal of, of room in terms of competences within the existing institutions and we should make those work. We don't want, however, an over-centralised Europe. Um, we don't see uh, a Europe in which, for example, the Commission issues documents like one which came across my desk some while ago, which was on the grassroots um, sport issue of the European dimension of grassroots sport. That's idiotic. This is a test, simply, I think. Now, if in the United States and Canada or Australia these things are dealt with at the state and local level. They shouldn't be dealt with at the EU level here. That's a good, basic, convertible or federal test. When Nick Clay, my party leader, was uh, a member of the European Parliament, he wrote a pamphlet which was called To Do Less Better. And that is very much the British approach. Let's make sure we get an effective and integrated single market, not spend quite so much time talking about other potential detailed common policies. Not an EU with a federal budget, and if you want to talk about the multilateral, multi-annual financial framework, let me simply say that for any national politician currently preoccupied with cutting welfare spending, telling civil servants that they will either have lower pay next year or, in the British case, paid frozen for several years, and attempting to find other cuts to your national budget, it is very difficult, indeed impossible, to justify to your electorates that you should spend more on the Brussels institutions. Britain has been a net contributor to the EU budget since 1973. We have demonstrated our solidarity in that sense. Um, and. Uh, we continue to demonstrate our solidarity by being a net contributor. 
but uh, we want to be honest about where the budget comes from and where it goes to. We want to see an EU of law and of open exchanges, law enforced, reciprocal cooperation, including on things like the European Arrest Warrant, and human rights maintained and enforced. Some of you may know about Article 13 of the Amsterdam Treaty, which introduced the concept of individual rights and um, protections into the EU treaty for the first time. That was very much the result of lobbying by British non-governmental organisations. And in the process of looking at that, I realised that the British had stronger human rights, domestic legislation on individual rights than most other EU member states for the painful reason that we have struggled with Catholic Protestant discrimination in Northern Ireland and had been forced to adjust our law in that regard when the new clause appeared in the treaty, the Germans and the Austrians and some others found it difficult to implement because they lacked the domestic legislation to put it through. So, let me wind up. Um, the image of Britain portrayed in the popular press um, and reiterated by some British politicians um, is sometimes a little out of joint. And I know it's very easy to say, well, the British are turning their backs on Europe. Um, we, we should be sorry to see you go. We know you're leaving. We're not. Um, we are not the only country which has increasingly sceptical attitudes to international cooperation amongst our voters. The same is true of the Netherlands in Finland, in Austria, in Germany, and I dare say also in Poland. The reality of Britain is that Britain is Europe's most open economy and most open society. Open economy in terms of inward and outward foreign investment, and in terms of the sheer diversity of our society. It probably wasn't reported in Poland that both the leading candidates for the French presidential election came to London to canvass their voters, because London is the seventh largest French city. <laughs> um, and uh, when Helen and I go shopping in London on uh, a weekend, we hear very large numbers of people speaking French as they walk up and down the road. And that's the French minority estimates it's about 400,000. Um, we have a German uh, community in London, a Swedish community in London, a Dutch community in London, a Polish community all over the country, as you know, one of our neighbours in Bradford referred to the post-Cold War wave of Polish immigrants to the north of England as the second coming of the Poles. It's a lovely religious phrase. Um, and um, that incidentally is one of the reasons why Britain finds it difficult to drop our entry uh, controls for Schengen. We are and remain the most attractive destination for people coming into the European Union. We indeed now find a good deal of secondary migration. Somalis, Turks and others who settled in Germany or the Netherlands or France or Denmark who then moved to Britain because as a Turkish restaurateur was explained to me uh, some weeks ago, London is so much of a friendlier place for people like me to set up in business. Um, that has tremendous advantages for us although there are sections of British society who don't entirely see it that way. Britain does not have a blueprint for the future of Europe, but neither does any other member government. Our coalition government has a range of views, as do many others. We are sceptical about building institutions for their own sake, and we've got a little sceptical about calls for solidarity for its own sake. But we are saying we are in the EU by choice, not by default. Europe is our neighbourhood, and we are committed to making our neighbourhood prosperous and secure.